which board member, what policies you'd like, and we can provide them. But it is pretty voluptuous. Uh, I would say, John, the best thing for you to do is go back and look at it as what pertains to the board, put it in one section, as it, as it, train, as it pertains to purchasing, put it in another section. And, you know, I think if you, do, if you do look at it, what sections could be combined. But the thing is for you to have the volume there for anybody, whether it's we the Brownsville Herald yeah. or anybody that wants to look up something that's there. We do have all I have copies for every board member. It's just pretty great. Well, but I have them in Norman's office. We don't have a set complete set there. Uh, I did hand out a copy of a uh, proposed School districts are a substantial amount of load uh, and revenues, and that kind of a reduction uh, could, could impact the utilities. So there's going to be a lot of opposition to that, and just wanted to make the board aware that that's out there and we're looking at that. Uh, got a couple of short presentations. First, I want to start off with a financial report from the under. Good evening, uh, Chairman, members of the board, Mayor. My name is Mike Perez. I'm the accounting manager. I'm going to be doing the uh, financial report presentation. Here we have a, a summary of the adjusted gross revenue, uh, presenting the monthly and year-to-date uh, revenue. For the month of March 2006, the net operating revenues were 13 million and the year-to-date net operating revenues were 86 million After adding uh, other revenues, interest from investment, <coughs> other non-operating income, the uh, total gross revenues for the month of March. 2006 for 14 million 289,000 and the year to date gross revenue was 91 Once the uh, fuel and energy costs, hotel energy expenses, and cell phone expenses are uh, deducted, the adjusted gross revenues for the month of March 2006 were 7,727,000 and the year to date adjusted gross revenue was 45 million this, this adjusted gross revenue is the amount that's being used to calculate the, uh, the city transfer. Here we have a summary of the project and lease obligations, uh, the O&M and non-operating expenses for the uh, month of uh, March 2006 were 2,969,000, and the year-to-date total expenses were 19,319,000. After uh, we add in the uh, debt service obligations, which are the uh, long-term uh, debt and uh, commercial paperwork expenses, the uh, total requirements for the month of March were 4 million five hundred nine nine hundred and twenty-five thousand, and the total year to date requirements were 31 million three hundred sixty-five thousand. By reducing this uh, obligations from the adjusted gross revenue, <coughs> and after deducting the city of Brownsville usage, the uh, total available balance for surplus for the month of March 2006 was 2,419,000 and the year-to-date surplus was 11,649,000.
The city's PV share of the surplus was $2,226,000 and $9,423,000 respectively. Here we have the Brunswick PUB surplus summary. Uh, as you all recall, the ordinance calls for uh, certain reserve accounts, and so therefore, on a monthly basis, the PUB has been transferring funds to meet these reserves. The year-to-date allocations were $9,423,000 total. In the month of March 2006, the PUB allocated approximately $2 million towards these reserves. The remaining items in this presentation are summary graphs comparing last year's year-to-date actual, current year's budget, and current year-to-date actual. As you can see, the 2006 actual operating uh, net operating revenues have exceeded the budgeted in last year's year-to-date revenues. The 2006 actual net operating revenues exceeded the budgeted amount by 12.3 million, a 16% change and 25.6 million from last year's actual. This is a 42% increase. The 2006 gross revenues of 91.2 million exceeded budgeted by 13.7 million. That's an 18% change and 27 million from last year's actual, a 42% increase. Now the year-to-date actual adjusted gross revenues of 45.3 million after deducting, of course, the uh, fuel and energy, wholesale energy, and sophomore expenses, is comparable to the budget and represents an increase of 6.4 million over last year's actual, a 16% increase. <clears throat> the fuel and en energy costs continue to rise. Uh, the year to date fuel and energy expenses exceeded budget by 4.5 million, a 15% change. The year to date expenses also exceeded last year's actual by 13 and a half million. This is a, uh, an increase of 65%. On the other hand, the O&M expenses, year-to-date actual expenses, uh, were 17.9 million, and they were under the budgeted amount by 1.6 million, and 8% favorable variance. So year-to-date actual expenses exceeded last year's actual by 1 million, a 6% increase. The year-to-date surplus available of 11.6 million has exceeded the budget by 1.2 million, a 12% change, and exceeded last year's actual by 2.8 million, a 32% increase. The surplus available to PUB represented 9.4 million dollars. The surplus available to the city of 2.2 million was actually below the budgeted amount by approximately 400,000 dollars. The primary factor for the decrease is the uh, rising fuel and energy costs. The city's usage year-to-date has exceeded the budgeted usage and last year's actual usage, and thus contributing to a smaller cash transfer. This graph represents a utility contribution balances to the surplus fund. Electric contributed $8.4 million to the surplus, which was over budgeted amount by $1.31 million, an 18% change. Water contributed $1 million to the surplus, a decrease of approximately $300,000 from the budgeted amount. Wastewater contributed $2.17 million to the surplus. That's a $280,000 increase over the budget and $800,000 increase over last year's actual. Overall, the percentage <coughs> contributions to surplus by electric, water, and wastewater were 72.8%, 8.6%, and 18.6% respectively. This graph summarizes the electrical uh, monthly consumption. As you can see, the consumption has been decreasing since October 05 through February of 06. In March 2006, PUB is starting to see an increase in consumption, uh, primarily due to the hot weather. March, con March consumption was 78.4 million kilowatt hours. That's a 6.8 million kilowatt hour increase from the month of February 06, representing a 9.4% increase. <coughs> For the month of March 2006, the water consumption increased approximately 67,400 gallons from last month's consumption. That's a 14.4% increase. The March 2006 water consumption also represents an increase over last year by approximately 62,700 gallons, 
That's a 13.2% increase. For the month of March 2006, again, the uh, wastewater consumption also increased approximately 25,500 gallons from last month, a 7.9% increase. The March 2006 wastewater consumption also represents an increase over last year by approximately 30,700 gallons. This uh, last slide uh, provides the status of the year to date capital expenditures by utility and funding source. As of March 2006, the actual capital expenditures were 5.4 million, of which the majority of 3.7 million were from the improvement fund. Another 8.7 million dollars has been encumbered by the PLs and invoices for existing and new projects, bringing the year-to-date capital expenditures to 14.1 million. This represents 35.3 percent of the 39.9 million approved capital spending plan. Uh, this concludes the financial presentation for the month of March 2006. Does anyone have any questions? Any have any questions? Yes, sir. Tab 2, uh, 7701. That, that's tab two, right? Mm -hmm. Tab two. Account 7701. On page four of tab two. Page four of tab two. Account 7701. Mm -hmm. See that? Yeah. Uh, what? How come the difference is so large there? From the approved budget. Mr. Sanchez, my name is Fernando Sainz. The, the reason for the fuel cost of status rate being as high as it has been is that the units of status rate have been asked by ERCA to run to support the electrical grid. Uh, and it is something that, that uh, normally is not, not occurring unless there is a system problem uh, with, with the, the uh, voltage level within the electrical system. I will, will say that whatever that cost is to operate those facilities, the ERCOT system, that's the Electrical Liability Council of Texas, will reimburse the utility our cost of operation plus 10%. So although you do see a cost there, what you will see as a, as a counter to it would be the, the wholesale revenue. So we recover all that cost plus, plus a 10% market. And how, how long do they take on that? Uh, they, they do an immediate payment with le within less than 60 days, and then they true it up at the probably 90-day period before it clears out. As if all the paperwork gets submitted on a timely manner. How about the next page, page five? On the account 7726, also a, a huge difference. Is that? These are economy purchases that we make off the market. Uh, when we discuss the, the way that our portfolio is set up on generation, we self-generate out of Oakley Union. Uh, we also self-generate out of the Hidalgo and, and the uh, Savas Ray plant. Uh, there is a component there of less than, than, it's in the neighborhood of about 28% of our purchases that come off of the market. So those are times when the market is, uh, is trying to, to clear energy and we purchase it against our units. So it's an economy purchase of power that is less expensive than us running our own units. Does that How about page, yes sir, thank you. How about page 10? Are you looking at the uh, check register? Uh, yeah, yes sir. The, the number 93480. Uh, 125,000 in the city of Brownsville. All right. Could you? I, I know there's a little description there, but I'd kind of like to know a little bit more about that. The uh, city of Brownsville passport? That's, that's the, uh, true of, on the, uh, whenever we go out and do work and tear up the streets, uh, we put Caliche back and then fill out a work order. We send it to the city. They, in turn, go and repair it and bill us. So we probably have had uh, to catch up on some of those. And so we're paying them once we true up all those bills with them. That's the way that works. That's 
How about, um, um, maybe there's one or two more, I'm sorry. That number on um, page 17, 93, 7, 24. The uh, Bronco City Employees Federal Credit Union. Yes, sir. This is what's being withheld from the employees for deposit into the credit union. Are they PUB employees or City of Brownsville employees? Because it says City of Brownsville. Well, we, are, we are a member of, it, it's a credit union that is the City of Brownsville employees and the PUB employees. So when employees are either taking money out of their checks for savings or to pay a loan or whatever, it goes to because we're members of that credit union. Uh, we have, a, we have an agreement with the city to be participating in that credit union. Thank you. How about page 24? Check 3445. Like about $1.6 million. City of Brownsville. That's the, uh, yeah, that's the EPA's collections that are being collected on behalf of the city. City of Brownsville. So we're just uh, cash transfer. transferring the cash back. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a few other questions. <coughs> it's all right. One is we did have a some rolling blackout, and I wanted to do a brief presentation on what happened and why why we had that. That's okay. Chairman, members of the board, uh, John asked to report on the blackouts that occurred on April the 17th. I've asked our manager of the Energy Control Center to put on a presentation that kind of flows through the sequence of events as the, uh, the problem that we experienced uh, occurred across the state. Are you going to cover all this? Please? I'm going to cover that in a lot briefer form. I wanted to say that, that uh, there are a lot of concerns. I think <laughs> work for work. It's 66 pages long, but I know I'm just going to go ahead and give you some time back on your on your agenda. Actually, what we what we have done is uh, the the Public Utility Commission was concerned because this this occurred in such a rather rapid fashion uh, that they've asked ERCOT to generate a report on what happened and how it occurred. Uh, there are so, there are 66 pages, as I say, in the report that you have there. That's in there just because it's it's how ERCOT. Uh, developed it. We have concise it and we will go over a more shortened version of it for you. Uh, Robert will set up a slide presentation for you and, and we parse that down to just a few slides. Uh, before we get, get started, I wanted to address what it is that ERCOT is and what it is that PUB is as a part of ERCOT. Uh, in the beginning when, when PUB formed, uh, it had its own generators out at the Silas Ray plant. kind of sat there as an island of its own. Uh, as, the, as the community grew and, and the South Texas region grew, and as well as, as uh, population growth grew, there was a need to start the interconnect systems within the uh, city as well as the region and as well as the state. Uh, so eventually, uh, Brownsville had enough generation to service customers, and at times there's stories at South Australia that there, there, there would be a, a, a dropping of one generator and the, all of those would flow onto the other one and it would groan and moan as it tried to, to uh, sustain power to our customer. But what we have now is a more advanced system within the state. Uh, while we, we do uh, participate with ERCOT as a, as a utility, uh, we do have some benefits that we receive uh, by being a participant of a larger system, but it doesn't come without having to make our own contribution to the system whenever the system calls upon the utility for additional capacity or energy. Uh, so as far as what, what happened on the uh, 17th, uh, we were able to avoid an entire system-wide blackout because PUB was uh, a part of the solution, uh, took the, the steps that we were asked to take by, by ERCOT uh, in order to avoid the system degrading any further than it did. Uh, so Robert's going to go over the sequence of events, how they occurred, from the ERCOT perspective and then for, uh, for Brownsville PUB. And then we'll take questions.
Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mayor. My name is Robert Avila, the manager of the Energy System Operations. And tonight my presentation comes from a preliminary PUC report on the events that occurred April 17, 2006. The PUC report is uh, 68 pages in length and can be found on the PUC website. I've selected about 27 pages that I believe capture the day's events. I can try to shorten that. Uh, some of the slides I'll go over. I'm just going to hit a bullet or two, just the high points on those. So bear with me. Okay, uh, some of the preliminary, preliminary conclusions. Some of the root causes. We had uh, unseasonably high temperatures in April, which we'll be showing you some slides on that. Uh, forecasts were significantly underestimated. We had 14,500 megawatts of generation that was down for, for maintenance, for plant maintenance. An additional 2,440 megawatts of generation that, that actually tripped offline. <clears throat> okay, ERCOT struggled to meet rapidly growing demand during the afternoon because of the limited generation availability. Um, basically assessed the system and they moved through the emergency, er, electric, emer, emergency electric curtailment plan when it became apparent that there was no other option. Uh, decisive actions of ERCOT system operators combined with the rapid implementation of the decisions by generators and transmission distribution companies prevented the need to automatically trip even more customers to prevent uncontrollable cascading blackout from, from occurring. WC is the emergency, emergency electric retailment plan. And once again, it's implemented whenever we're, there's uh, shortages of, of generation. These are the four steps of WCP. <coughs> which we did go all the way through step four, uh, which is um, dropping load. Uh, difference between rolling uh, outages and cascading blackouts. A rolling blackout is an, order, an orderly managed process where individual distribution feeders are intentionally cycled on and off to reduce damage on the electrical grid or demand on the electrical grid. <coughs> uh, most companies target between 10 and 45 minutes. Ours were 30 minutes. Um, cascading blackout is an uncontrollable escalating event where major portions or all of the region lose power, including many or all of the power plants. Uh, on April 17th, we had record setting temperatures. Uh, weather forecasts were high, uh, high temperatures, and uh, the demand was growing rapidly. The actual demand would have been about 53,000 megawatts if we didn't have the interruptions. These are some of the temperatures, though. The yellow bars are basically showing you normal high temperature for, for April 17th historically. And this is what we were showing April 17, 2006. So you can see quite a difference there. This is how the demand actually rise between 9 and 3 p.m. Um, you can see this is ERCOT's total load. We ended up hitting 50,265. This graph right here shows all of April of 2005 and what the loads actually did. Well, April 17, 2006, this is where we were at. So you can see the difference. Not even a day in, in April of last year came close to, to this. But once again, plant maintenance, there was 14,500 megawatts that was down for, for uh, plant maintenance. We also had some unplanned outages. It was uh, 2,440 megawatts of generation that became available that day. Uh, 1,683 megawatts of that went offline in a 30 minute period around 4 p.m. Uh, 11 a.m., demand was 39,467. 11.58, we had a power plant trip, a 513 megawatt power plant that tripped, uh, running at about 243 megawatts at the time. It kind of goes through the demand through the day. We lost another generator of 163 megawatts. Around 1 p.m., demand was at 45,000 megawatts. It increased by 2,700 megawatts over the last hour. Uh, 2 p.m., 47,000 megawatts, which was 2,900 from the last hour. Uh, frequency began to decline. Uh, 3 o'clock, we had 50,265, and uh, that had increased more than 2,400 in the past hour. At 3.25, uh, ERCOT declared uh, WCP Step 1, 
And basically all we're doing, we're trying to do there is maintain our, our uh, reserves. They also obtained 150 megawatts uh, from a DC tie and 30 megawatts of assistance from a CFE across the uh, DC tie and Eagle Pass. At 334, Cod declared step two. Uh, responsive reserve was deployed, LARS were, were deployed, and that's when we started getting into shedding some light. Uh, okay. We had another power plant trip at 351. Demand now was at 51,714, and it increased by another 1,449 megawatts. Uh, that was with 1,150 megawatts of interruptible demand removed from the system. Another power plant trip at 401, another one at 404, both of them around 220 megawatts. And another power plant trip at uh, 408, another 420 megawatts. So you see that demand is going up and we're losing generation <coughs> here. So things are getting pretty, pretty severe. At 413, ERCOT declared double ECP step four and uh, ordered rolling blackouts. So basically, they requested that all of ERCOT shed 1,000 megawatts of load. Uh, our share of every 100 megawatts is 4 tenths of a megawatt. So we had to shed 4 megawatts. <coughs> this is kind of a breakdown right here. It's just all the different companies and what they actually have to drop. It just goes back to what I said. Our share is uh, 0.41 for every 100 megawatts of, of load. So they asked us to drop 1,000, and our share was 4, four megawatts. And, uh, once again, just things keep on deteriorating. We're losing more generation. Uh, they called step three of the double ECP, which is actually already understood. Once we're at four, anything underneath it is in there. So we're asking, we're asking for public appeal for conservation. They're kind of PR people are doing that. Yeah, one of the units came back online and tripped right back off. Um, the demand is at 51,634, and that's with the rolling blackouts. So actually, load would have been between 53,000 and 54,000 megawatts at the time. Lost another power plant. Um, rolling blackouts in about 610, and they, request, they lift the request for voluntary conservation. Interruptible customers are restored. Preliminary conclusions, I'm going to go ahead and skip this, it goes on, basically this covers it in a nutshell. Uh, the emergency procedures and implementation of these procedures ultimately serve the exact purpose for which they were created. ERCOT operators' decisive actions combined with the rapid implementation of their decisions by market participants avoided triggering 5% load shedding to prevent cascading blackouts. And emergency procedures as a whole provided protection against catastrophic cascading collapse of the ERCOT electric grid. Like that. Any questions? Board, any questions? Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all I have to do report. Yeah. Okay, then we'll move on to. Well, first, I'd like to have a motion to see if we can tie in item 7 through 12. Uh, so we can vote on the approval. These are basically all just the uh, supplies and capital improvement project contracts that uh, PUB bid it out for, and, and they're recommending the lowest bid. So moved. Um, second. Got a second moment. So we got a see, uh, first moment. So got a second moment. Mr. Sanchez, all those in favor? All right. All right. Against motion passes. I would also like the motion to move item number six in front of five. So moved. I'm, uh, okay. Motion by Mr. Sanchez. Second. Second one, Mr. Garcia, in favor? Aye. Okay. Now we're going to go to item number. <clears throat> item number three, consideration and approval proclamation of the Board of Directors of the Brownsville Public Utilities Board for the City of Brownsville, recognizing and commending John L. to the Board, Mr. Robert Sanchez. Yes. Mr. Chairman, let me brief proclamation. A proclamation of the Board of Directors of the Brownsville Public Utilities Board of the City of Brownsville, Texas, recognizing and commending John Alton Glor for his unselfish and dedicated service to the Brownsville Public Utilities Board 
and resolving all matters thereof. Whereas John Alton Glore, dedicated to the development of Brownsville and through Glore Development, donated the property in North Brownsville, where in 1987 the Brownsville Public Utilities Board constructed a two million gallon elevated storage tank facility to meet the growing water demands of the city. And whereas John Alton Glore was instrumental in developing several Brownsville subdivisions, including Cross Country Trail and Mission Trails, and most recently the Wood subdivision, and where possible selected the Brownsville Public Utilities Board as a service provider for utility services and contributed <coughs> in the continued growth of electric water and wastewater load for the utility. <coughs> and whereas, most recently, John Alton Glore was appointed by the City Commission of the City of Brownsville to serve as a member of the City's Capital Improvements Advisory Committee, where he served from September 2005 until his passing in April 2006. And now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Brownsville Public Utilities Board of the City of Brownsville, Texas, that such board recognizes and commends John Alton Glore for his unselfish and dedicated service, and that this resolution be entered upon the minutes of the Board of Directors of the Brownsville Public Utilities Board this eighth day of May 2006. So I would like to have a motion by Mr. Sanchez. Second. Second by Mr. Garcia. Those in favor? Aye. All those against? Motion passes unanimous. On to item number four, it's consideration and approval of the transfer of the administration of project share program and funds to the Cameron Winnesee County Project Scheme. Is Mrs. Amalia Garza, the Executive Director of Cameron Music Council, will be making a presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor, Board of Directors. My name is Amalia Garza, and I'm the Executive Director for Cameron and Willis County's Community Projects. We administer utility programs throughout the two counties. We had, for the last two years, we administered a little, a little over a million dollars and PUB received about 20% to 23% of those monies. This program, the SHARE program, would fall right into the programs that we now administer. We are mandated to follow the Health and Human Services uh, income guidelines. We also go with the household consumption history. So the uh, household would get those months that are high as far as consumption is concerned. Now, with money such as the ones that you might be offering, would be that we would loosen up a little bit of those regs. For example, there are households that may have an emergency and may not fit into the program design that we now have, which is high consumption months. So I would appeal to you to, <clears throat> excuse me, that that would uh, be allowed. And the agency, of course, would introduce a design to you and find out what, where you stand with what we would be suggesting. We would also submit uh, reports to you so that you'll know exactly how the money's being spent. And this money would be only for <clears throat> PUB customers. And uh, board members, I, I put this uh, item on the, on the agenda because as you know, we've had uh, two golf tournaments uh, and the money that's been put in the, in the SHARE program, for, in, the, in the SHARE program, it, uh, the human services is, uh, is administering those funds but uh, in the two years, I think they've uh, they've dispersed less than three thousand dollars, or a little over three thousand uh, dollars, out of the approximately twenty-four, twenty-five thousand dollars a year that we put in there. So there's some money in there, and the uh, the whole purpose of that uh, of those monies was to go out and give it to the people that need it. And I think uh, we're not doing a good job with this with uh, human services, uh, and it's not I'm not blaming the organization, but I think it's just. Uh, all the paperwork that they have to go through and all these guidelines, and it's a lot of red tape. Uh, the Cameron's, uh, Cameron and Willis counties have a, a more flexible program that uh, it's been proven. They've been working, they've already worked with PUB, they work with CPNL. Uh, these funds, they have a, a good program, it's, it's proven, it, and it works. The monies are going to get out there, the, uh, and it's going to benefit just the uh, Brownsville PUB customers. This would require annual approval, uh, right? 
Well, if we get uh, my recommendation would be to give it to them from now on. Yeah, but it would be best to let the, let's see how it works in a year's time, then bring it back to see you know, we want to continue doing it that way. I, I would. Uh, I, I want to give these monies to to them, and if that would uh, you know, and see what they can do with them. And but basically, what we want to do, Mrs. Garza, is get the monies. By the time the next golf tournament comes around, we should have no more money. You know, if you just give it out to the people that need it. I think that's that's what they were intended. This is strictly for PB customers. Yes, it is. And we have four centers that serve uh, possibly. I'll make the motion uh, to authorize this on an annual basis. Uh, that each year they come here and provide us some accounting of how they disperse the money, and that we approve it each year. I one just a quick question. Um, how, how much of, of uh, if there is an advance of $20,000, does the $20,000 go directly to PUB ratepayers, or is there a percentage that goes to cover administrative and overhead? And no, so it would be direct services. Oh, 100% would go to direct yes, services. Okay. I'll second that motion. Now that uh, the, mon the, the whole money that are in the share program, if you want to include that in your motion? All the monies that are in the share program of today. All, all the monies that are in our custody for for uh, for, the utility for the utility customers that are having a hard hardship in paying the bills. And they have criteria that the funds for be transferred to this uh, program here. Uh, Cameron Wilson, uh, County's community project. Are you saying? I'm sorry. I understood it was going to be the money <coughs> from the golf tournament. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not all the money that comes into Project Share. Well, the, 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 the money. Project Share funds to help people pay their utility bills. I understand that, but every month, <coughs> excuse me, every month, the, the ratepayers ask if they want to contribute. The majority of the money that has been collected over the last two years is off term return. Uh, I'll give you an example. I think we gave you all the report. I uh, sent out a memo for the first quarter of the year. We have about thousand dollars collected through contributions. So okay. So your your motion. Uh, the whole, the whole, is all of that money. Okay. That's correct. As long as it goes to manage it wisely and there's some accounting and no money's going going to overhead, uh, you know, this strictly to help the well, citizens. If, if that money is coming back to PUB, wouldn't we just simply they send over it's a voucher? Kind of they have that some, they have like a voucher system. And that's it? They have a we voucher system that uh, I think Mrs. Rice is going to get together with Mr. Hernandez. Yeah, just to clarify a couple of things because we just need to be careful on the <clears> Uh, the money that's donated from the community to share, like for instance this year so far, uh, year to date, has been about $2,000. 50% of that, $1,000 went directly to share, uh, to share. The other 50% went to Kids Voting, United Way, the Katrina, uh, and the Brown Society for Prevention of so We're talking just about the money that's the share. The I know, but the, the, the problem is what you're seeing, the $60,000 that you see in the share account, is not, that's everything. That also includes thirty thousand so dollars. We wanted to say the motion is right. just the money's collected for specifically the purpose, for yeah for the purpose of now of the sixty thousand that you see in the financial statement that says share like thirty four thousand of that is for the scholarship fund. The other monies have been uh, have been donated. Uh, last year in two thousand five, we assisted two hundred and sixty customers in the amount of twenty five thousand dollars, and this year so far one hundred and twenty seven customers or twelve thousand two hundred and forty dollars. We do about 20 customers per month at $100 a head. But whatever the board decides. It's legal, legal. Give us the verbiage for the ocean. Uh, that way it's restricted to just those funds that we collect for the purpose of helping the uh, underprivileged or disadvantaged people that are, that are having problems for utility. Well, Mr. Ramon, I don't know that I can articulate it better than that. Okay. Um, we, so we, had, we, had a, we had a motion and we a second by Mr. Just, just those yes, funds. Yes, 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 Strictly right. to those funds. Okay. But Mr. Villarreal, all those in favor? Aye. Okay. All those against? Motion passes. Thank you Thank very you. much. You're not help. <laughs> you didn't mean that. Thanks. Okay. Now we're going to go to item number six. Uh, the presentation of the maximum allowable impact fee per equivalent service unit <coughs> applicable within the certified water and wastewater service areas of the Council of Public Utilities Board. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm just here to report the actions of the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee on the 27th of April. Uh, Black and Beach completed the Brownsville Public Utilities Board water and wastewater impact fee analysis and presented the maximum allowable impact fee calculation to the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee 
as I stated on the 27th of April. Uh, this is the long-awaited number that everyone has been waiting for. Uh, this was done once the committee approved the land use assumption plan report and the capital improvement plan. Uh, the end result of the study is that the maximum allowable for purposes of assessing impact fees for the purchases of water uh, was $1,336 per equivalent service unit. For wastewater, the maximum allowable was $1,754 per equivalent service unit bringing the total maximum allowable that could be assessed for the purposes of collecting impact fees to $3,090. Uh, there is one thing in the uh, report that uh, should be mentioned is that the calculation for the maximum allowable also recommends upgrading the, the standards on how you arrive at the equivalent service unit to the current uh, standards, which is the American Water Works Association standards. So it, it does change a little bit from the 1990 standards. Uh, what it did do was create a larger number of equivalent service units, which again is a credit back towards the calculation. Uh, but that is the number. And the committee um, did uh, review the calculation, uh, did accept it. Uh, what you have in your package is the written comments uh, that were forwarded to the city uh, that reflect the committee's action on the um, land use assumption plan report, the capital improvement plan, and the maximum allowable. Uh, it has been forwarded to the city of Brownsville with request that they proceed with establishing the notice and the schedule of public hearings. Uh, they'll have to go before the city commission before any action is taken on what amount of impact fees will be assessed. Yeah, I want to stress one thing because I think the paper was quoted in the uh, committee. If you take into account the 1990 fee of $2,200, I think it was $2,300 for it. And you factor in the inflation since 1990 to now, it would have surpassed the 3090 in my opinion. Okay. So the uh, magic number that they came up with, the maximum allowed of the vote, in fact, the 3090 was a lot less than what a lot of people were thinking and saying and, you know, speculating about. So, it, it, had, it had nothing to do with inflation. No, it, has to do it, it is okay. simply uh, a clinical uh, uh, formula that is driven by uh, you know various factors. But you are correct that it wasn't based on inflation. It's not uh, It was based on the assumptions and the total number of yes, service yes. units. It was based on the total adopted for the capital improvement plan. It was based on the estimation of you know various factors, and so what that number is is what it is, and that, again, it just re simply represents the maximum allowable that could be assessed for the purposes of imposing impact fees. After all the speculation, we have a number. So, yeah, that's good. so um, thank you. It's uh, just a report to the board. Thank you. Would you like to say a few things? Bill, welcome. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Ted. We're good. Oh, thank you. Gentlemen of the board and management, uh, ladies, uh, citizens, uh, my name is Bill Hussle. This was a greeting card. <laughs> uh, okay. Actually, while you guys read these questions, what I'd like to propose is uh, on behalf of the uh, Valley Builders and Developers uh, is that you table this item so that there's time to discuss these questions. Uh, and there are there are serious issues. Rather than go into a debate at this point, my prayer is, in fact, you guys passed a great announcement in honor of John Gore. My words to his family were, today was a sad day, burying a friend and colleague is never joyful. Notwithstanding the pain, I can't help but be joyful for having had the opportunity to know him. To know him was a joy, to be his friend was an honor. 
Mr. Don Lock. At this point, Mr. Hudson, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is not part of the agenda, and so That's, I would be concerned. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. While they're reading, uh, I understand it's not an action. Yeah. It's not an action. Well, so it's something that needs to be considered. My prayer would be uh, that uh, and that you guys read the questions and and or allow me to speak a little bit uh, and ask the questions. Bill, you know, with with um, all the friendship that this board can offer you, okay. As a very uh, important citizen of this community, one who's contributed a lot to this community, yeah, do you think one who, one who uh, through experience, uh, brings a lot of wisdom to this board here. Uh, we respect you. Uh, these questions are all very good, legitimate questions, and they should be asked. Uh, and I think the process uh, is through, it's going to be sent to the city commission for public hearings, and it's going to be like two months of public hearings, like two months of public hearings. And I think that's the time when we can, should be able to address some of these questions or debate or whatever, because what we have here is not even an action item, it's just a presentation. The uh, uh, the uh, the impact committee did its job already, I mean, and we were very restricted as to what we could do uh, as far as, as, as you know, our, our scope of work. We did the land use, we hired the expert, he came back with a recommendation, and uh, the allowable figures, the allowable figure based on the, the analysis he performed. So now these questions that you want to uh, get answered to during the two month period, you will have the opportunity to address and get the answer. With respect, uh, this is not an action item? That's correct. Simply a presentation. I will make uh, two comments and then uh, excuse myself. Uh, comment number one, the city of San Antonio went through a capital improvement pro process with the same engineers as you guys and came up with a 10-year capital improvement program of $97 million. Your engineers came up with $84 million for a five-year program. I don't get it. San Antonio's 1.6 million people, Brownsville, MSA, including uh, San Benito and Harlingen is uh, almost half, uh, no, less than half a million. Three times as many people. Uh, less money, I would question the numbers. I would pray that this board would ask the committee and direct it to follow uh, Chapter uh, 395 of the Local Government Code. This is important. Lincoln, Nebraska, that was comment one. Comment two, Lincoln, Nebraska passed uh, uh, impact fees. The developers challenged it. The developers lost. Housing starts went down 40%. I hope that you've all, I know that you've all received, I hope that you've read the economic impact of building in Brownsville, recently presented by National Association of Home Builders, which is 4,000 jobs, 4,499 jobs, 14 million in taxes, and $160 million in local income last year, and ongoing as a result of the building activity, $53.7 million, that's going forward. If we continue the growth, $13.7 million and 1,672 jobs. If the intention of this board is to kill the growth, the engine, this economic engine, then the impact piece is a great idea. If not, then I implore you to follow the spirit and the letter of section 395 of the state law. We've done it wrong. Mr. Hudson, uh, like uh, Mr. Amada says, the Capital Improvement Committee, they've done their work. It's, I mean, what you what you say now, you should have been there at the at the hearings, at the, at the public hearings that they had, the workshops that they had. Chairman Vela was unresponsive, sir. Okay, and, uh, and the developers asked to be a part of it. There was developers on the committee, including the gentleman that we gave a proclamation here tonight, Mr. Mr. John Glor, that which unanimously voted for. He's a long distance call, sir. Uh, my, my good friend Bill, uh, you know, your questions are legitimate, okay? I mean, I'm not going to try to respond to each one because it's, I'm not an expert and, 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 and I'll have time to, right now, to digest everything you got here. But there All you guys need to do is acknowledge the report. This is not an action item. Go for it. But, but You're making a mistake. You, as a board, for 16 years, PUB has done the wrong thing. It's time to do it right. I implore you, start doing it right now. Bill, we wanna, Mistakes in the past can be forgiven. We, we want to we wanna make sure your needs are met, okay? This is land use driven, okay? 
So based on the development that's expected for the future growth, that's how this this committee uh, came up with, with what we did, and, and the and the study was done based on your needs, developers' needs, not your particular needs, but developers' needs. So it's it's driven by the need of a of a, of a sewer uh, station. It's driven by a need of infrastructure and all that stuff. That's got to be paid for. Okay, so. With your questions in hand, go to the public hearings and get some answers to them. Okay? We will do so. We just employ you as a board of the municipal and utility, which is a treasure of our community, that you will not uh, continue this process outside of the spirit and letter of the law. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Mr. John Bless. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman. Uh, maybe John or Eddie or Council could answer this. I know we're going to vote on, on those on this, but the final say so is with the city commission, correct? That's already this is, we, yeah, we're already done. done. Yeah, we're done, done. done. Okay, we went. What you can do if you wish at the next meeting, and that is if you certainly want to make a recommendation or forward your feelings to the city commission, you're just like anyone else can. Uh, you've done that with the resolution on the land use assumptions. You've done that with the resolution on the CIP. Uh, uh, but ultimately, it is the city commission who will have to consider all those comments and make a determination of what the impact the amount should be. All this does is establish what the ceiling is. That's all it does. And they got to go through a process. Sure. They've got to open up to the public. But, you know, I thought us being board members, we would have the final say so on that fee no. with the public utility no. board. No. Uh, you know, um, it's going to go to the city commission. <coughs> We've got to remember the old campaign financing situation. Very dangerous. A lot of the commissions being financed by special interest. Well, and I just wanted to say that, okay? <laughs> That's got to be very careful for the whole community. The developers, all the respect to you guys. You guys build some beautiful neighborhoods where the kids get to run around and they're safe and the families grow up. We love you guys for that. But we got to care about the ratepayers of the whole community. But all respects to you gentlemen. Very fine job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We're going to action item. It's not an action item, so we're going to move on to item number five. Uh, consideration of the of transfer of income. Item number five, consideration and approval of the use of diversion meters. And, uh, you know, fellow board members, I'll put this on the, uh, on the agenda, because this kind of, uh, well, it, it affects my business, but it affects other businesses also. Now, at the request, I mean, John, I'm gonna ask you this. If a customer comes and asks, uh, is a diversion meter the same thing as if a customer asks for a, a meter for the, you know, because, like for, a like for a sprinkler system, an irrigation meter? No, it's different. Okay, but we if they request one, will they, do they have to put it on? We don't have a policy on diversion meters. I think that's, you know, we, we allowed some of them to go in and basically to avoid, you know, or to calculate what the true or approximate true wastewater charge would be. What is it? The well, exactly. Doesn't the diversion meter help you be more exact in your calculation? It can, yes. Not now, the only, well, it, the it issue, does, that's the purpose of it. Yeah, if it's a true reading on the diversion. Right, exactly. Okay, that's the purpose of it. Like me, I got a pool and, and, and I want to put some sprinkler systems. If I want to put a, a separate meter so I'm not paying sewage uh, for the water that I'm using on the pool and the sprinkler, I get a separate meter that should reduce my, my water and wastewater rate. Wastewater. Wastewater. But that's different though than but the, the same diversion. Thing with diversion it helps you determine exactly how much is being used and how much should be charged for wastewater. That, that's the point of it. That's the point of it. Yeah. There's some difference. So why do they want to do away with it? We're not. We're not. We don't. So I guess want the issue is we have a, a rate right now for commercial on, on that. We don't have a policy on diversion. There's some issues. One is, and Gigi can address it, but diversion meters aren't put out like on the street where we, they're in the property, they're in the, wherever they are, that they're not as secure as if they were at the street or after the fact. 
So you so, want to make a policy making it more accessible well, to PV? I think if we're going to do it, we have to open it up to everybody that would want one. Yeah, well, we I don't think, have a policy. That we ought to maybe establish some criteria. If you are going to have a diversion meter, here's the criteria. Uh, right now, a customer can put it on and we, we go read it, uh, but it's in the property. We don't know what happens within the property. Tom, what do you mean by within the property? You mean like in a Is that a building? Jeff Eastman? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, may I mention some of the issues that, that we have with diversion meters? Uh, Diversion meters need to be installed within the premises, and they're usually inaccessible to PUV. They're usually inside private that, property. That can be corrected with a policy. Yes, and again, it's because we don't have a policy in place okay. right now. They're inside private property. They're usually inside a building under lock and key, so we, we're not able to read them. Uh, areas where they need to be installed, usually leave them open for tampering. Uh, possible cross-connection and contamination of water system, possible bypasses causing inaccurate reads. Uh, PUV needs to be able to control, maintain, and monitor these meters. Uh, the meters, water mains, sewer mains, um, anything like that uh, we will be maintained by PUV are required to be in easements dedicated to the utility. We need to have a right away of en right of entry at any time, and of course no liability in case of any damages in private property. And then the other problems regarding the diversion meters as of right now, we have no set policy or testing procedures. The meters would need to be compatible to primary meters. And of course, the enforcement of policies with any existing diversion meters, uh, we would need to have uh, that. And I think all those are good points, but I think uh, and then it's our fault. We should have had a policy. To well, do. We, I mean, we, if we were, if we're gonna, if we've been allowing this to happen, and we have never set a criteria. Yeah. It's not their fault. It's not the no, fault. And, and that's why we're bringing we it here. We, we, either, we either need to set up some criteria and guidelines that the board can approve, I think or not have them and, and, and come up with a new rate for the water, which is what we were talking about doing. How quick can you? Can you well, I think can it's not fair to, to estimate 90% uh, of water uh, and, 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 and charge of 90% for uh, wastewater. Just because we don't have the meter. Actually, we came up with a rate of about sixty percent. But based is not based on consumption as far as it's just based on a global thing that you say. Okay, he well, used he used a hundred gallons, so you're billing sixty gallons. Yeah, those aren't the, now, the, the maybe rate, not using sixty rate, gallons for wastewater. Done on actual figures. Well, yeah, but the rates see the rates were done on actual figures, but it benefits some and it hurts others. Now the the whole the whole idea of the diversion meter is not to not to get a break not to not to pay what it is pay what it is what it is it is what it is you pay what it is right but there there's no uh, at, at the at the moment there is no rate that allows for that the rate is ninety five percent we put in diversion meters I think, I think as a the test. I to do is come up with a policy that addresses your concerns and makes it applicable to customers' needs because we're here to serve the customer. Not to rip them off. I understand. Okay. So if and I want the customer to have that assurance that they're paying for what they're getting, they're not paying for what somebody else is getting. Okay. So whatever their usage is, whatever those usage is, that's what they should be doing. So then, can you work on a policy then? Yes. Okay. We'll have it at the next meeting. All right. That's fine. So then we're going to move on now to. Thank you. Thank you. Item number thirteen. You want to say something? No. So table this one? Yes. Oh, yes. Do I have a motion to table? I make a motion. Motion by Ms. Ramada. Second, Second by Mr. Sanchez. Yes. All those in favor? All those against? Aye. Uh, okay, item number 13. Discussion of possible action to stall street lighting in Brownsville on Highway 48 and State Highway 21. Is there a motion? Second. 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 We never, we never acted on it. Yeah. Well, no, we said we were taking that as a group, but we didn't vote on it. Seven through four. Yeah, we did. Seven through four. Did we pull that around? No, we got it. Come on, Mayor. Pick up. Okay, number thirteen, Mr. Sanchez. Yes. Uh, last uh, PUV board meeting, I brought up the uh, something I've been looking at coming into town from different angles at nighttime 
about the minimal lighting on the east entrance and on the west entrance, which is Highway 48 on the east and a 281 on the west. But and last time we, we discussed this, it was it has to be initiated by the city or the state to request it. Has there been a request from the city? No, but hold, hold, the thing is, Pat, um, we talked about it last time, and there was a presentation, mm -hmm. and uh, we stopped it. Uh, you know, with all respect to you, my, my fellow board member, you stopped it, and it is now the next month, and I want to hear the report from them. The, the, the staff worked hard on it. And I think, I, you know, I and, and the other citizens that are wondering about this deserve to hear the report from the PUB staff. Also, um, I think at the last meeting, many told me it's a state highway on Highway 48. You need to, uh, you're way outside of the city limits, Mr. Sanchez. Well, I went up the overpass and it, the city limit sign in the city of Browns was right on the top of the overpass. So, and my concerns from the overpass into town, and the city limit sign once again is on the top of the <coughs> overpass. So, just looking at the city limit sign, that's inside the city limits. So, is Mr. Bruce Heck, his staff here to tell us a little bit about sure. that? Yeah. James. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Got just a very brief presentation. I can maybe uh, answer some of your questions tonight and we can follow up one later if we need to. As you probably know, PUB installs and maintains street lighting poles and fixtures. Uh, throughout the city, uh, we've also got some street lights that are installed and maintained by Magic Valley Cooperative and, uh, and AEP. Uh, from time to time, the, at the city's request, we make street lighting proposals uh, in areas needing additional lighting. Uh, we follow the general directions for street light installations provided to us in our service policies. Um, and we install street lighting only with the specific uh, authorization from the city because they pay for the initial installations and the monthly maintenance fees. Uh, what you see before you now is the area from Boca Chica right here where my mouse is. Going along 48, each little red dot is a street light. And here's the overpass that you're talking about and more or less the center of the overpass somewhere in this vicinity uh, where, uh, uh, yes indeed, the city limits start. So from the top of the overpass down to the uh, exit to the port, uh, there are no lights. Uh, we've got just one or two lights. Near that intersection, we pick up just a few lights coming into town here, and then as we get closer to town, we pick up more lights. Uh, actually, we've got uh, about 72 lights installed from, from this point down to Boca Chica. Our uh, policy would tell us that we probably need about 97 lights, about 24, 25 more lights in that area. Uh, again, we've had no request from the city and up to this point from anybody to install additional lighting at, at those locations, but we are in the process of making up some estimates where we can pass those on to the city. If we move to the other side of town, and you'll see some of the 9,700 lights that we are maintaining at this time. Uh, how many? About 9,700. For the entire city? Yes. Um, let me get my bearings. Here's 802, uh, Boca Chica down here again. Here's the turn near our uh, military highway substation, and Alton Glower right in this area here. So uh, again, we've got street lighting uh, beginning basically at Alton Glower along the military highway. There are a few points here and there where there are no street lights, but basically it's pretty well covered. Uh, from Alton Glower to Boca Chica, there's uh, some 48 lights, uh, according to our general policies, we'd have about 52 lights in that area, so we need to add four or five more lights. From this area north is still within the city limits, but we've had no development, no PUB development in this area. This is basically AEP and uh, Magic Valley territory. Uh, it would be our intent as development does occur in that area and we extend lines. We have no lines up this road past 
just the north side of Alton Lower. As we extended lines north uh, along 281 to residential subdivisions, we would have, again, make proposals to the city on adding street lighting, but that has not happened to date. <coughs> That's the basic uh, presentation. Be glad to try to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, if the city added the uh, lights that we're talking about, it would be, uh, depending upon the, the type of pole that they wanted installed and uh, some other variables, it would be a fifteen dollars to $20,000 initial expense and about a $700 a month addition to their cost. For how many? For, uh, we said 25 and for about 30 lights. James, that's a, that was a good presentation. You know, and that, that was good. I learned about how many lights the city had. Who knew there was 9,700 lights there? But as we saw on the presentation, my analysis seems to be correct. From the east side, more than the west side. You guys are suggesting just four more on the west side, and I think 25 on the east side. I think it's good for the citizens of Brownsville. Yes, the. Uh, City might bark at that, but you know there's some they're they're, they're doing okay with cash going from PEB and, and other and positive situations that are going on over there. I think they can. I think they'll make the right decision and put those lights there, especially with that Rosaka right there. That you know doesn't have any railings either, and it's dark. We just all learned here in the city of Brownsville about the, the mom and the child that went in there and they saved the mommy and the, and the child very i saw you married y'all did real good there with the with the mom and the child in that presentation and uh, we just don't i don't think that should happen again and we really need some lights over there and i don't know who's responsible for maybe some ratings along that resort over there because there's a lot of tourists that go through there and they don't understand brownsville they don't know like we know brownsville and we don't want anything like that to happen you got one from there uh, <laughs> hey, uh, okay, so, but uh, I think uh, the I think the mayor will take that full consideration and give it hundred percent attention. Uh, but uh, if we don't, uh, we're going to go on to the next item, item number fourteen. Uh, discussion on PUB risk trap policies and ordinance, Mr. Almada. Okay, I wanted to bring this out because. Um, it doesn't affect me personally, but it does affect a family member of mine, uh, my son. He's opening up a little restaurant, <coughs> which I advised him not to, but he decided to do it. And he's leasing some space in a building that has a grease trap. And there's a little portable a taco stand next to that building that's tapped into the grease trap. It's a 500 gallon grease trap. This portable building doesn't produce very much grease. In fact, it qualifies for a grease trap under the sink. And I wanted to bring this out to, sh to show how, in my opinion, how stupidity gets a hold of people and they don't think out of the box. In order for my son to open up the restaurant, he's got to install a grease trap, another grease trap. It's going to cost him $3,000. So we looked at it. Hold on, Pat. There's one already in there. There's a one already. But he has to put another one. He has to put another one. And the same site. Same site. But somebody's already using. So, somebody's already yeah. using now. But it's a little portable. You know, one of those uh, portables that sells like tacos yeah. or whatever. And he qualifies but, for a But the one that's or... using it is outside the building. It's outside the building. Outside. The building. Okay. But anyway, uh, we for two months my son's been trying to get away from to connect to the grease trap and allow the other one. Stay in the grease trap also, but now we weren't able to resolve it. So to get it done, you either lie, misrepresent, or just find a way around it to get it done. And we did find a way around it. The gentleman with the portable is going to disconnect from the grease trap, so my son can connect to the grease trap. Okay. And the gentleman with the portable is going to have a, a, the system underneath the sink. It makes no sense. It just makes no sense that this gentleman has to disconnect when they can both share the grease trap, either by requiring a deposit to guarantee that if there's something goes wrong, that there's some, you know, somebody's going to pay. Can I ask this? Or one? somebody just accept full responsibility for both. I thought that's what we spent, and, they, and I thought they did a great job of really, really looking into this to address similar related issues. 
so that in the event somebody's not producing the grease, they don't get hit for it for, for having to put in a new uh, 500 gallons with the minimum producer. And if they get a, 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 a uh, under the sink unit, but they start producing volume, which can be checked and verified, but I'll, why doesn't this situation I think fit only, within what we just passed? It does, I think, with the exception of the, the issue we had here, and someone from pretreatment is here, but there's two in the one grease trap, so if there's I guess that wasn't discussed. You know, who we'll pays the surcharge? I know I talked to Pat, he said his son will pay the surcharge. My understanding is that this was resolved, and I'll ask for pretreatment. But stop, not, to, stop to think. Three thousand dollars. Listen, listen to this. Three thousand dollars to open up. A, what size? Uh, how many square feet? Is that? Uh, a couple hundred square feet. I think. What? A couple hundred square feet. The restaurant. Uh, which one are you talking about? Uh, inside or outside? Yeah, uh, inside. Awesome. About seven hundred. Seven hundred square feet. And the portable building is what? Fifty. It's uh, maybe hundred. Okay, 120. That's 820 square feet on the same side. He he has to spend three thousand dollars for a grease trap. And I think it's two thousand two hundred dollars for a deposit on utilities. See, if he's got one already in there, why don't well, you? Wait a second, wait a second. But this is this this how. Remember the word I said. It goes beyond 